Today we are talking about the winners and losers following Gemini 3, basically how the race has shifted following the latest Frontier model dropping. Welcome back to the AI Daily Brief. As is to be expected, following the launch of Google's Gemini 3, the discussion surrounding the entire AI space is all about, one, how the model is performing in practice, not just on the benchmarks, and two, how the release of Gemini 3 changes the overall AI landscape. Now, when it comes to that first question, how the model is performing, I have had a chance to start to put some reps in. I've had initially really positive experiences with some data analysis and visualization that I was doing on the AI ROI benchmarking study, but I'm not yet in a position to give a full review and to talk about the use cases that I think Gemini 3 is most valuable for. Look for that sometime later in the week, as both my experiments and other people's experiments have a little bit more time to mature. The other part of the conversation, however, around what the release of Gemini 3 does for the industry is something we can discuss right now. I went through and I gave a bunch of different groups red light for having a bad day, yellow light for having a mixed day, and green light for having a good day. And we're going to use that as a framework to also look at a bunch of recent news. Now, where we're going to start is with a big announcement from Microsoft, NVIDIA, and Anthropic. This dropped about an hour before the launch of Gemini 3, and I can't really tell exactly if it was timed to try to sneak in out of the wire, or if this was just planned as a big announcement as part of Microsoft Ignite, and it happened to coincide with Gemini 3. In any case, what was announced was a big deal between NVIDIA, Microsoft, and Anthropic, a massive new multidimensional strategic partnership. As part of the deal, Anthropic commits to buy $30 billion of Azure compute capacity, NVIDIA is investing $10 billion in Anthropic, Microsoft will invest $5 billion in Anthropic, NVIDIA and Anthropic are going to collaborate around design and engineering, as well as establishing what they call a deep technology partnership. As Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella pointed out, Microsoft Foundry customers will now also be able to access Anthropic's Frontier Cloud models, although it should be noted that although they will be available through Azure, Amazon will remain Anthropic's primary cloud and training partner for the time being. When it comes to the NVIDIA part of the relationship, Anthropic is committing up to one gigawatt of compute capacity using NVIDIA Blackwell and Vera Rubin systems, and a lot of the other points of collaboration are at this stage a little bit hand-wavy, although I'm sure they'll get more real over time as the companies dig in. Anthropic's chief product officer, Mike Krieger, points out that Anthropic is now the only Frontier AI lab that is partnered with all three major clouds, Google, Amazon, and Microsoft, and I think this is pretty reflective of the place that we find ourselves at this point in the AI competition. As much as there is a vicious competition and battle between these providers, and ultimately there will be winners and losers, at this stage, everyone needs everyone. It's a lot more frenemies than kumbaya, but no one has the ability to go it alone or even stick closely with their solo strategic partnerships. The speed of things is moving too fast. The constraints to development are too great for any one company to support on its own. And as much as the markets are squawking about the circularity of deals, the reality is just basically that the 10 to 20 biggest companies in AI are all going to work with each other on basically every aspect they can for the foreseeable future, based on the presumed ubiquity and market penetration that this industry ultimately will have. Now, one note about the investment, the $15 billion being invested into Anthropic from Microsoft and NVIDIA pushes the company's valuation up to the $350 billion range, a massive number that puts them a lot closer to OpenAI's half trillion. Still, it wasn't the big fundraising that led me to give Anthropic that mixed rating on the winners and losers charts from yesterday's Gemini 3 announcement. On the one hand, there is some inherent challenge for any other frontier model provider, given Google Gemini's size, growth rate, and the incredible apparent capabilities that this model has. In other words, it's harder to compete with Google when they've released Gemini 3 as compared to when they had Gemini 2.5. At the same time, when you look at the benchmarks, the two that Gemini 3 didn't win outright were both behind Claude Sonnet 4.5. They tied at 100% for AIME 2025 with code execution. But the big one, given Anthropic's dominance as a coding model, is that on Sui Bench Verified, Claude Sonnet 4.5 still outperforms Gemini 3 Pro, and by the way, GPT 5.1. I saw a number of different independent testers that found something similar. Bindu Reddy wrote, Gemini 3 barely inches out GPT 5, but is behind Sonnet 4.5 on coding and agentic capabilities. Sonnet 4.5 continues to rule in the combined agentic and coding arena. So like I said in the note, I think Anthropic had a surprisingly mixed day, especially when you consider that we're talking about Sonnet 4.5, not Opus 4.5. Next up, let's talk about OpenAI. In the same way that I think Anthropic has harder competition now than they did before the launch of Gemini 3, I think the same applies for OpenAI and ChatGPT. And indeed, there was no shortage of it's so over for OpenAI posts. OpenAI in particular had an even more skeptical eye given their recent spate of dealmaking. Jen Zhu writes, 
So if Google has a better flagship model, Quen, Kimi, DeepSeek have better open source models with wider adoption, free and cheap API, Anthropic is winning Enterprise, and XAI is better on long context reasoning with real-time access to X, how will OpenAI get $100 billion in revenue by 2027? There were other folks who were less snarky, but just pointed out the resource constraint challenge. Elmer de Braven writes, Why ChatGPT is going to fall behind Gemini and Grok? OpenAI can't scale up compute fast enough. Sure, they are trying, but they're too slow in comparison to Elon and Google. The difference in intelligence will eventually next year become clear. At the same time, I think this is much more mixed than people are giving it credit for. Yes, the benchmarks show a meaningful improvement between Gemini 3 and GPT 5.1. 5.1 is a great model and is basically having exactly the opposite response from consumers as GPT 5 did. The folks who want more personality are liking it better, and the people who want better strategic collaborative thinking are liking it better. Plus, there are already specific examples of use cases where people are finding 5.1 still beating out Gemini 3. Swix runs an AI curated AI newsletter and did a comparison and came to the conclusion GPT 5.1 is better than Gemini 3 is better than all the others and it's not particularly close. He also gave about eight reasons why he thinks 5.1 wins. Alex Finn, who it seems has a very similar set of use cases as mine, writes, I've been testing Gemini 3 for over a week and it's incredible, extremely smart, the best straight up problem solver and getting answers AI ever. If you need information, there's no tool better. It's not quite there yet though when it comes to vibes. I use AI 80% of the time for business planning and creative writing. I use it to be my project manager, come up with new novel ideas for products and features to build, and as a business consultant to bounce ideas off of. It doesn't quite have that human feel GPT-5.1 thinking has. So on his use case list, creative writing and business planning still go to 5.1 thinking. Like I said, it's too early right now for me to make a strong statement about anything, but my initial instincts are that I'm going to find something similar. 5.1 is my favorite model for creative and business strategic collaboration since 03, and I've been finding myself enjoying it enough that it's actually significantly increasing the amount of time I'm spending interacting with AI on those types of use cases. The point of all this is that ultimately I think that Gemini 3's launch, even its improvement relative to 5.1 on some of the benchmarks, feels within the band of expectations and not some mortal blow. And despite Google being the bigger company overall, ChatGPT does have the unassailable brand association with AI chatbots. For many people out there, it is simply what AI is. Now, one company that I think we have to discuss that's not primarily a model or chatbot company, but that does have implications from yesterday, I believe, is NVIDIA. And for them, I'm suggesting that they had a red, not-so-good day. The simple reason for that can be read on page 2 of Gemini 3 Pro's model card, where they write, Gemini 3 Pro was trained using Google's Tensor Processing Units. TPUs are specifically designed to handle the massive computations involved in training LLMs and can speed up training considerably compared to CPUs. Now, it's not surprising, obviously we know that Google has been building these TPUs, but the fact that TPUs and not NVIDIA GPUs were used to train what is now the most state-of-the-art model, at least according to the benchmarks, does, I think, have implications for the unassailability of NVIDIA's position. John Guibus writes, People are sleeping on how impressive it is that Gemini 3 is fully trained on TPUs. Kakashi writes, TPUs are Jensen's biggest nightmare. That's one of the main reasons he's pushing NVIDIA GPUs onto Anthropic with the investment incentives and urging OpenAI to keep using cloud providers that rely on NVIDIA rather than Google. Entrepreneur Siki Chen writes, Regarding Gemini 3, for the past four years, I've had the plurality of our liquid net worth in NVIDIA. About a month ago, I sold it all and rotated into Google. Take from that what you will. Now, I don't want to overstate things. NVIDIA is still in an incredibly advantaged position. And at this stage, TPUs are still a Google internal advantage rather than something that they're selling to the market. But this certainly opens up more opportunities for them as their own business line in ways that could impact NVIDIA in the longer term. Now, it was interesting as I was preparing this note, how much Meta didn't come into the conversation. When it comes to Meta and AI this year, the story has really been two parts. The positive side is that at this stage, they have the only AI-related wearable that people actually like, which is, of course, the Meta Ray-Bans. And that's, I think, a much bigger advantage than maybe people are appreciating. Still, mostly this year has been all about restructuring and reorganizing of their internal processes. It's been about Zuckerberg going and poaching and building the superintelligence team, about the bringing in of Alexander Wang from scale to lead the new efforts, and really we're waiting to see what comes out of that. Ultimately, the next big test will be whatever model they choose to put out next, but the short of it is they really needed to be a banger. One optimistic thing is that a couple of years ago, when Google was struggling, it was because they had a lot of divided and distributed efforts around AI, 
in a similar way to how Meta has up until the last couple of months where they've been trying to sort of ruthlessly align things in a new way. It took multiple layers of Google reorganization and ultimately bringing everything together under DeepMind and naming it in one direction for their efforts to really start to come to the fore. But from here, now we have to get into who were winners from yesterday's announcement. And the first category absolutely is the AI market bulls. There is incredible fear in the market right now. In fact, in the fear and greed index generally, we're at a 13 with extreme fear driving the US market. A big part of that is concerns around overspending on the AI buildout and the potential of an AI bubble popping. So much of the economy is tied up in AI expectations that people are, of course, getting more and more nervous. Now, we've been following this quite closely, and so I don't need to belabor the point. But one of the things that is important to note is that among the signals that people are looking for when it comes to whether they think we're in boom or bubble territory is whether it seems like we're hitting performance plateaus. A big part of the latest leg of this bubble talk was, of course, the feeling of plateau that happened around GPT-5, even though it wasn't exactly true. And we've consistently had a correlation between the sense that AI is hitting a wall or hitting scaling limits and the market's general sense of the AI bubble. We talked yesterday about how these benchmarks, at least, represent a major jump and really throw some cold water on the idea of a scaling wall being hit. In fact, Adam GPT, who does go to market at OpenAI, shared a meme of a man wagging his finger saying, no wall for you capturing the sense among many that Gemini 3 really shows that there is more to get when it comes to scaling these LLMs. Google's Oriel Vignals actually talked a little bit about how they got the performance that they did. He tweeted, The secret behind Gemini 3? Simple. Improving pre-training and post-training. On pre-training, contrary to the popular belief that scaling is over, the team delivered a drastic jump. The delta between 2.5 and 3.0 is as big as we've ever seen. No walls in sight. On post-training, still a total green field. There's lots of room for algorithmic progress and improvement, and 3.0 hasn't been an exception thanks to our stellar team. So like I said, AI market bulls, big winners from yesterday's announcement. The second big winner category is the vibe coders, and specifically I'm talking about here the non-technical vibe coders. In other words, the section of the vibe coders, like myself, who are not ashamed of the vibe coding title, and who are not wrestling with the autonomy spectrum and how much we want AI to respond to us versus be independent agents that go off and code on their own. No, I am talking about the mass democratization of people who can create with code now thanks to these vibe coding tools. And for all of us, and I think there are a lot of us, 3.0 totally kicks butt. 3.0 appears to be a big jump up. Now, we did talk yesterday about anti-gravity, the new IDE from Google. And so you might be wondering, should I have a rating for the AI coding companies like Windsurf and Cursor, etc., that now have a new competitor? I guess if I did, I would also have it in the yellow column in the sense that new competition from Google is meaningful and they have to take it into consideration. But they also all have experiences where they get to take advantage of the latest models as well. And you're already seeing that with the way, for example, that Replit has integrated Gemini 3 into their new design experience. Now, this is one that I've had a chance to play around with a little bit. And good lord, is this so much better than the off-the-shelf design that you were getting from some other vibe coding tools just a few minutes ago. I haven't had that much time to play around with it yet. But it appears to me that Gemini 3, at least integrated into this overall experience that Replit is offering, represents a major advance in the quality of the design that comes with vibe coding. And that is something that I will absolutely be taking big advantage of. There are also so many people who have shared the games that they vibe coded. Overall, I think that one of the biggest green categories of winners from the Gemini 3 announcement is the vibe coders. And of course, the other big winner on the day is Google themselves. This really represents the capstone where Google went from how the hell are they behind, to underwhelming Bard, to the first versions of Gemini suggesting rocks and glue on pizza, to their image models creating black Nazis, to, by the end of last year, hey, Notebook LM is a pretty cool product, maybe they're getting their groove back, to a year this year, where the number of users has rocketed to 650 million monthly active users, where the amount of tokens processing has jumped dramatically in the last six months, and where Gemini 3 is now, at least by the benchmarks, the best model in the world, and certainly in rarefied air, even among consumer preferences, for that very top slot. On top of that, as we've discussed in this show, and as Ben Dixon points out, Google is the only company that has control over the full stack. Applications, foundation models, cloud inference, and acceleration hardware. Menlo Ventures' Didi Das writes, We're in the what-if-Google-does-that part of the AI cycle. They can make cheaper models, better models, distribute products at no cost to billions of users, get good unit economics because they own TPUs and use it to retain premium talent cheaper. He points out, of the big tech giants, Amazon and Microsoft chose to be infrastructure partners, Apple chose not to play, 
Meta shat the bed, Google is coming out on top. Interestingly, this is sort of consensus enough that others are simply asking how it happened. Air Katakana writes, What I want to know is how did Google go from way behind to easily number one in all domains of modern AI in like a year? The answer, by the way, to many was what Peter Levels pointed out, the return and reinvolvement of Google co-founder Sergey Brin. Whatever truth there is in that, ultimately Google is heading into 2026 in an incredibly strong position. And at least from a consumer and an enterprise perspective, whatever else happens next, that is nothing but gravy and upside for all of us users. So that is my sense of the lay of the land, the winners and losers after Gemini 3 day. How long this remains, the state of things remains to be seen. People are still just starting to experiment with Grok 4.1, and Elon seems to think it's a bigger deal than people are giving it credit for. And when it comes to Anthropic and OpenAI, we could still get GPT-5.1 Pro and Opus 4.5, and things could feel quite different again. Like I said, ultimately, the biggest winner is all of us users, who seemingly every couple of weeks have new capabilities and new use cases that get unlocked. And I certainly plan on taking the time to go take advantage of them. For now, that's going to do it for today's AI Daily Brief. Appreciate you listening or watching as always. And until next time, peace.